In order to fully comprehend the way Newton's laws or Newton's second law is used to analyze the dynamics of circular motion, we need to look first at different coordinate systems. We've been using a rectangular coordinate system with two perpendicular axes that we call X and Y. Suppose this is a particle and, or it's just a point in space and there's a vector defined at this point in space. It could represent the velocity of a particle, which is currently right here. Maybe the particle's moving in this direction. It could also represent the acceleration of that particle. It could even represent the force on that particle. Whatever the vector is, I've called it vector A, and I have resolved it into components. And we've been doing this for months now. The X component of the vector is the component that is parallel to the X axis. The Y component is parallel to the Y axis. And of course, these two components are perpendicular to each other. So we know this is a right triangle. That is how you resolve a component or a vector into its rectangular or Cartesian components. You don't have to use these axes, however. Even if this is my uh, a global coordinate system, I could imagine a different set of axes centered on this point here. Let me draw those now. Instead of an x-axis that goes in this direction, I could choose an x-axis in this direction. And I would need a, a perpendicular y-axis. And because these axes are different from my original axes, I should give them different names. I will call this the X prime axis, and this is the Y prime axis, X prime and Y prime. And I can now resolve this vector into components along the new axes. Since it'll be difficult to, uh, to visualize with two sets of components, I used just a regular pen for these components. I'll use the marker for the components along the X prime axis. Hopefully you see that the, the component of this vector, this vector A along the X prime axis looks something like this. And the Y component would be parallel to the Y prime. I, I should have said the Y prime component, not the Y component. So I've got the X prime components and the Y prime components. So an appropriate label for the, this darkly dashed X prime component would be A sub X prime. And this would be A sub Y prime. So it's a little cluttered, but hopefully you see that, that this vector could be resolved in two different ways. You could write it as this vector plus this vector. Remember, tip to tail addition, that's how it works. You close the triangle. Or you could write this vector as this vector plus this vector. In each case, you're resolving your vector along two perpendicular axes, and we call the components Cartesian components. Because the X prime coordinate just tells you how far you would have to move along the X prime axis. The Y prime coordinate tells you how far you would have to move along the Y prime axis. And you could, you could pick any set of perpendicular vectors centered on that point. Well, the coordinates that we're using in this chapter are not Cartesian in many cases. So let's look at polar coordinates. Okay, I'm gonna draw a little circle and that means I have to adjust my compass here. I've drawn here a circle centered on the origin of these X, Y axes, just like before. I'm looking at a, a vector which is defined at this point. Again, if this is a particle, this vector could represent the velocity of the particle or its acceleration or the force on the particle. Those are the vectors that we, we use in this class. Later we'll see it could be the torque on the particle, the angular momentum of the particle, whatever the vector is, you can resolve it into a components which are parallel to the X and Y axes. But in this chapter, we're doing something a little bit different. So let me take a look over here. Let's look at a vector defined at this point. You know what? I need to draw it a little bit longer, and that would not give me room. So I'll go right here. Suppose we're looking at a vector which points off in this direction. I could, as before, <clears throat> 
break this into a rather long negative x component and a short negative y component. But here's what we're going to do instead. Instead of x and y, or i hat and j hat, the i hat direction, the j hat direction, let's pick a unit vector, which is in the direction of the position vector. So if this is the origin of our coordinate system, the position of this particle lies at the end of a vector that goes from the origin to where the particle is. We call that the R vector. Well, I'm going to draw a one unit long vector that starts here and points in the same direction as R. So pretend this vector is one unit long. Notice that it points away from the origin. That vector is called R hat. R hat. Well, just like with I and J, I hat and J hat, we need a second a unit vector, that's a, a vector that's one unit long, which is perpendicular to r hat. And by convention, this is how you choose that vector. Since positive angles are swept out counterclockwise, theta would increase, you know, if I, if I imagine the r vector out to this point, this would be the angle theta. The direction of increasing theta would be this direction. If I move this point that way, theta would be increasing. So I'm going to draw a perpendicular vector, which is also one unit long in this direction. And I will call that theta hat. It points in the direction of increasing theta. Okay, now these two vectors are not the same as i hat and j hat. i hat would point in this, direct, whoop, this direction along the positive x-axis. j hat would point in this direction. These are two different uh, orthogonal unit vectors. Now let me show you how you can resolve this vector into components. I don't want to use the, the marker because it'll be too confusing, so we'll go with the, the pen here. Okay, does everybody see? Ah, it's not like you're going to answer me here, but this vector is the same as this vector plus this vector. Add these tip to tail, that's the same as the original vector. So if I were to call this vector B, for instance, since I already used the letter A over there, if this is vector B, this would be the component along the theta hat unit vector. So I should call it B sub theta. This is the component that's in the same direction as R hat, away from the origin. So this would be the B sub R vector. It works the same as it does over here, but instead of using the subscripts X and Y, I have to use R and theta because those are the names of my unit vectors. Now, previously when I drew, when I drew this picture, let's suppose actually that we were talking about the force vector, which would have an X component called F sub X and a Y component called F sub Y or we could resolve the force into components along x prime and y prime. It would be valid to say this, that the sum of the forces along the x prime axis are equal to mass times the acceleration along the x prime axis. So I could look at all the forces on this particle, find the net force and look at its component along the x prime axis and set that component equal to mass times the acceleration along this axis. Remember, acceleration is also a vector, so you can always resolve it into components along any two orthogonal vectors. It's perfectly fine to apply Newton's second law along any axis if you're using rectangular coordinates, x and y. So I could make the same statement along the y prime axis. Or you could stick with F equals MA along your original axes. So the, the reason it works for both coordinate system is because they are Cartesian, AKA rectangular coordinates. But things are a little different when you're talking about this coordinate system. And before I 
get into that. Let's, let's uh, observe how these vectors change depending on where you are. If the particle were over here, for instance, well now your r hat vector, remember it always needs to point away from the origin, r hat would point in this direction. And I didn't mean to make it longer. This is still supposed to be one unit long. Theta is still increasing in this direction. So theta hat is a perpendicular vector with the same length, length one, that points in this direction. Okay, so this is theta hat. And if I had a vector over here, let me call it vector C. I could resolve vector C into components, one of them along theta hat and one of them along r hat. So it would be appropriate to call this the theta component, c sub theta of the vector c, and this would be the r component because it's along r hat. And again, uh, these are not the same as i hat and j hat. They point in different directions. In fact, they're not even the same as they were previously. Do you see that this theta hat is not at all the same as this vector? They point in different directions. This r hat points in a different direction from this r hat. So the, the direction of those vectors depends on where you are in the plane. In each case, r hat would point away from the origin. Theta hat is perpendicular to r hat and it points in the direction of increasing theta. Okay, well, the reason we need this for this chapter is we are applying Newton's second law, that's the main dynamical result, along for, for problems in which something is moving in a circle. So does this imply, if we were to, uh, to use these equations along these axes, that the R axis and the theta axis, does that mean that we can write the F, excuse me, the R component of the force should equal mass times the um, R component of acceleration? And before I even write that, remember what acceleration is. A sub X is the second derivative of X coordinate with respect to time. These are the same things. We like to write A because it's easier, but you could just as say, you could just as well say F equals M D squared X DT squared. That doesn't roll off the tongue quite as easily. Uh, it's a lot easier just to say F equals MA, but the acceleration is the second derivative of position with respect to time. So let me introduce a shorter way of writing this for the purposes of this discussion. No need to use marker here just an alternate notation here. X with a single dot. This is a notation that's commonly used in physics textbooks. X with a single dot means specifically the first derivative with respect to time. You can take derivatives of X with respect to plenty of variables, but if you mean specifically the derivative with respect to time, we denote that with a dot, x dot. It's just, it's kind of like x prime, but the dot signifies the time derivative. So x double dot means the time derivative of x dot, which of, you know, of course is the time derivative of the time derivative of x. In other words, the second derivative of x squared. Ooh, keep doing that, moving off, off uh, camera there. Would you agree that this is a little easier to write than this? So for the purposes of this discussion, x dot, first derivative with respect to time, x double dot is the acceleration velocity along the x-axis, acceleration along the x-axis. So I could write f sub x equals m x double dot. That's a perfectly valid way to write Newton's second law. It doesn't look familiar, but this does say force equals mass times acceleration along the x-axis. Okay, similarly for the y-axis, y double dot would be the acceleration along the y-axis. So the question is, when we are using 
the r and theta axes. And I'm looking for the page on which I was writing this. Here we go. If we're going to use this alternate coordinate system, the polar coordinate system, can we say this? Since we're talking about force along the r axis, not the x axis or the y axis, would this be the second derivative of the r coordinate in, uh, with respect to time? In other words, is this the acceleration along the r axis? I'm going to put a question mark here. Similarly, can we postulate that the force component along the theta axis is simply equal to mass times the second derivative of theta, the acceleration along that axis. It seems reasonable, has the same format as the equations I just wrote, which I've already lost, already, excuse me, which I've already lost. F sub x equals mx double dot. It looks the same, doesn't work, unfortunately. This does not work. I'm gonna put a big line through the equal sign, it's no good. I'm going to hold it close to the camera, zoom in and out. Dun, dun, dun. You cannot use this. And it's really just a math thing. Math thing. It's not so much a physics thing. Um, it has to do with the fact that R and theta are simply not Cartesian coordinates. They have to do with a, a curved space. It's, you know, uh, we're not going to use this a ton this semester, but When you use polar coordinates, R and theta, they're fundamentally different from Cartesian coordinates. Instead of specifying how far you go to the right and how far you go up, you're specifying how far out you go and in which direction. That's a different way of locating a point than Cartesian coordinates. By the same token, um, if I were to draw a set of points that all have the same x coordinate, for instance, that would be a vertical line. This is a set of points that all share one coordinate in common. They all have the same x coordinate. When I look at polar coordinates, if I wanted to draw a set of points that all have the same r coordinate, in other words, they're all the same distance from the origin, that would not be a line, that would be a circle. Ugh, horrible noise. Totally different. If I wanted to draw a bunch of points that all had the same theta coordinate, well, that would be a line. It would be a ray to the origin, but it's not a vertical line. So it's a fundamentally different coordinate system. And that ends up being the reason why you cannot use these equations. So you might be wondering now, what is the acceleration along the R axis? What is the acceleration? along the theta axis, because it's certainly not, I'll just, right here, I'll, I'll uh, point out that the acceleration component, that's the component of the acceleration vector along the r-axis is not simply the second time derivative of r. And the acceleration component along the theta axis is not simply theta double dot. If, if these were true, you could just plot them in right here and use f equals ma. But the difficulty stems from the fact that, that these are just not equalities. So let's take a, a look now at the actual formulas for the components of acceleration along the r axis and the theta axis. And they're given right here. Uh, here they're given in terms of the basis vectors. Instead of r hat, they're calling it e sub r. Let's just blow past that and focus on this expression right here and this expression. Those expressions give the components of the acceleration vector along the r hat and theta hat axes, the r and theta axes. They're more complicated than you might expect. Remember, the x component of acceleration is simple. It's just x double dot, or d squared x dt squared. That's it. You just take the second derivative of x with respect to time, you're done. The y component of acceleration, that is, component of the acceleration vector along the y-axis is simply y double dot, second derivative of y with respect to time. So you might expect that the acceleration component along the r-axis would just be r double dot, but it's not. You've got this extra term. And 
For those of you who might study physics in greater detail, you'll learn this is called the centrifugal acceleration. I forget what this is called. This might be the Coriolis acceleration. Anyway, both of these expressions are a little more complicated than you might expect. So let's, let's look at this one for a moment. I'm going to write and copy this down on a sheet of paper. The component of acceleration along the R axis was R double dot minus R theta dot squared. What is that all about? Okay, well, in this chapter, every problem we do involving circular motion, I think it's safe to say you're moving in a circle of fixed radius. That's a little redundant because you can't move in a circle if your radius is changing. We're always going to be looking at circular motion problems where we're moving in the same circle. And if that's true, what can you say about R? Does R increase or decreasing? That's the whole point of a circle is you don't move farther from the origin or closer to the origin. So for, for motion in a fixed circle, R is constant. Your distance from the origin doesn't change. What does that tell you about oops, the first derivative of R with respect to time? How is your radius changing with respect to time if your radius is constant? Don't overthink it. That really is an easy question. If your radius is constant, it's not changing with respect to time. So its first derivative with respect to time is zero. And all higher derivatives would also be zero. So the rate of change of the rate of change is also zero. Nothing interesting happening there. Awesome. That means when we go back to this expression for the component of acceleration along the r-axis, we don't even have to worry about that term. It's simply gone. This is the only one we have to worry about. And if you look carefully at this and think about it, you may recognize it because we have another name for theta dot. So let me review that real quick. Hopefully you recall this from chapter four, I believe it was. Okay, so if you've got a particle moving in a circle and during some small time interval, the particle has swept out this small angle here, I'll, I'll call this d theta. So it moved from here to here, it moved through an angle, d theta. We like to call this little arc length ds. The radius of the circle is r. And I hope you remember that the definition of that angle, d theta, you take arc length and compare it to the radius. If this is one-tenth the radius of the circle that you're moving in, then this angle would be one-tenth of a radian. Simple as that. Of course, if you rearrange that, you've got ds equals r d theta. And now, let's divide both sides of this equation by the time interval dt. It's still an equation if I do the same thing to both sides. Okay, ds dt. That's the amount of distance you travel divided by the amount of time it takes you to do that. Those units would be miles per hour, meters per second, inches per second. You get it. We're talking about speed. This is your speed along a line tangent to the circle. That's called your tangential speed. So V tangential, and often we just call it V. We don't even need the T. Now, what is this right here? It's the number of radians you turn through per second, or in a different system of units, the number of revolutions per minute that you turn through, or the number of degrees per hour. Uh, the Earth uh, rotates through 360 degrees every 24 hours. Whatever the, the units that you're using are, we're talking about angular speed, angular velocity. And you've already seen we have the letter omega for that, the Greek letter omega. This equation can be rewritten V equals R omega. And I'm just going to call this V now. I hope you have that memorized from earlier in the semester. Now, do you remember that anytime something's moving in a circle, if this particle right here 
really is moving in a circle, doesn't it have an acceleration towards the center of the circle? We already looked at this. We used some geometry to come up with the formula for that acceleration. We called it the centripetal acceleration, but we gave it a subscript R. We said that it was V squared over R. Let's now insert this expression for speed. That would be R squared omega squared over R. And of course, this R cancels one of those R's in the numerator. And another way to write the centripetal acceleration would be R omega squared. You really should memorize that. That is the so-called centripetal acceleration. Some books call it A sub C or centripetal. We'll go with A sub R. And remember, it's directed towards the center. The centripetal acceleration we, all, we saw is always towards the center. However, in our discussion from the last 20 minutes or so, we used a coordinate system where, it's all mixed up. Where did I write? Here we go, on the other side of the page. Just a moment ago, I copied this expression from the internet for the acceleration along the radial axis. There it is, theta dot, I should have emphasized here. I could also call this d theta dt, that's the same as theta dot. D theta dt is the same as theta dot is the same as omega. So I could also have written this r theta dot squared. It's the same thing, r omega squared, r theta dot squared, different notations for the same quantity. And notice the expression I copied from the Weber nets has a minus sign here. But I am quoting a result from earlier in the semester and saying that the acceleration towards the center is simply r omega squared, not negative r omega squared. So what is up with the minus sign? That has to do with the choice of coordinate system. Can I find my original picture here? Let me pause. Okay, when I defined the r theta coordinate system, I had my r hat vector pointing away from the origin. That's how it's typically done in math books. If, if you've taken second semester calculus, I'm sure you've encountered this already. But remember, we know that centripetal acceleration is always directed towards the center. And now you understand why the expression that I got from the internet had a minus sign. If the positive r axis is off in that direction, away from the origin, then the centripetal acceleration really would get a minus sign, hence the negative r omega squared. Your book does things a little differently though. I think a lot of physics books do. We're gonna set up a coordinate system where the r hat vector actually does point towards the center. I'll talk about that in a moment. Now let's go back to the WeberNet page and look at the expression for the acceleration along the theta hat axis, okay. So we already dealt with the radial component. Over here would be the acceleration along the theta hat axis. We've got two terms here. So I'm gonna copy these down and then we'll take a look at those. A sub theta is R theta double dot plus two R dot theta dot. Okay. Messy. We have not seen either of these yet. Oh, well, have we? I think we've actually seen this one. Now, can we do something with this? Remember, for motion in a fixed circle, I don't really need to write this. It's already written up here. Your radius doesn't change. Your distance from the origin does not change. And that means r dot is zero. The rate of change of r with respect to time is zero. So we've immediately eliminated one of these terms. What about this second one here? Well, let me go back to the page where I was looking at arc lengths. Uh -huh. I believe that was this equation, yes. 
Okay. If I start with um, this equation, V equals R omega. Let me get a fresh piece of paper here. Fresh, yes, fresh paper, like orange juice. Sometimes I see billboards advertising fresh beer. I thought beer was aged for weeks. Why would you want fresh beer? That just doesn't strike me well. <clears throat> this is review, but if you take the time derivative of both sides of this equation, you get a third equation, which you've already seen in chapter four. What would be a good name for the rate at which your tangential speed is changing? Remember, tangential speed is how quickly you're going that way. If you're going this way, it's considered to be a positive tangential speed. If you're moving in the other direction, that's a negative tangential speed. That's because theta increases that way, counterclockwise. Well, if your tangential speed is accelerating, eh, I believe. If your tangential speed is changing with respect to time, then you are accelerating in the tangential direction. So let's call this tangential acceleration. That's the left side. If you're moving in a circle, R is not changing. So you can pull that out in front of the derivative. And we've got d omega dt. OK, is your angular velocity increasing or decreasing with time? So if you're spinning around and around, if you're starting to spin faster, or you're spinning down uh, to a slower rotational speed, you should be accelerating. We need a name for that. We call that the angular acceleration. So you've already seen this formula, R alpha. This is from earlier in the semester. You wanna have all of those memorized. Arc length is R theta, tangential speed is R omega, and tangential acceleration is R alpha. They all have the same form. Take your, your angular quantity, multiply by r to get the tangential quantity. Okay, now, a word about notation. Omega means d theta dt, and of course we can write that as theta dot. Alpha means Angular acceleration is the time derivative of angular velocity, and that would be d dt of this quantity that we're calling theta dot. Well, can't we just stick another dot on there? An extra dot means another time derivative. So this is theta double dot. So another way to write alpha would just be theta double dot. And that is the term that you saw in the formula for tangential acceleration, here it is. Of course, your book, your, uh, the webpage that I showed you did not call it tangential acceleration. They called it the acceleration along the theta hat axis. We already got rid of this term. This is the term that remains. What do we have? Theta double dot is R alpha. So we could also say A sub theta is R alpha. Isn't that what we just looked at, R alpha? That's the tangential acceleration. So what they're calling A sub theta, in other words, the component of acceleration along the theta hat direction, your book is calling that A, uh, A sub t, the tangential acceleration. They're just different names for something you could have studied in calculus two. So, Let's go back to that picture here. Yeah. R hat axis, theta hat axis. Isn't theta hat tangent to the circle? That is why your book calls this the T axis. You could call it T hat instead of theta hat. R hat and T hat. The one change being your book chooses to put R hat pointing back towards the origin. So let me just do one more drawing here. And we'll talk about the coordinate system used in this chapter. Here's another heavy duty industrial circle. Imagine you've got a point right here, a particle moving around. Maybe this is a car negotiating a turn through an intersection, or it's planet Earth going around the sun. The center is right here. Let me mark that. 
here's how your book does it. Instead of having our hat point away from the circle, they choose to put our hat towards the center. So that's the centripetal acceleration sign. Our hat is towards the center. It's a unit vector that points towards the center. Theta hat still points in the direction that uh, most calculus books do it. That's the direction of increasing theta, but they don't call it theta hat because this vector is tangent to the circle, they call it T hat. Now in R3, in three-dimensional space in which we live, or do we? Do we live in a three-dimensional or four-dimensional space? Take 3C to learn more about that. In R3, you need three perpendicular vectors, I hat, J hat, and K hat. If we were to find a third vector here, it would need to be perpendicular to both. It's the one coming out of the board. And you can use your right hand to see that. You put these fingers, right, it only works with your right hand. Put them along the T direction, curl them towards the R direction, and your thumb would give you the direction of the Z hat axis. If I try to use my left hand to do that, I put my fingers along T hat, curl them towards R hat. Now my thumb's going into the page. That's the opposite direction that my right hand gave me. So this coordinate system actually does have a handedness. Okay, this is the coordinate system that, that we're going to use for chapter eight. Any circular motion problem, whether it's a, a vehicle going around a racetrack, a planet going around the sun, the moon going around the earth, the entire solar system going around the galaxy, the entire galaxy, which is the Milky Way orbiting the common center of mass of this galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy. Beyond that, okay, I'm tapped. But this is the coordinate system you want to use. And you have to keep in mind that as this particle goes around, these axes are changing direction. The R hat axis must always point towards the center. So as this is going around, it's changing directions. T hat is always, I don't think this is helping this graphic. Okay. I hope you get it. And for, once again, for motion in a fixed circle, here's what we can say. The sum of the forces in the, along the R axis is mass times the acceleration along the R axis where Radial acceleration is simply V squared over R, which is the same as R omega squared, which is the same as that last one was four pi squared R over period squared. We'll talk more about that, but there are three separate but equivalent formulas for the centripetal acceleration in a circular motion problem. But don't forget, this is only valid you can only substitute this for a sub r if r is not changing. Remember there was that extra derivative web page I showed you, there was an r double dot in there. We can throw that away because we're not looking at problems that involve spiraling outwards or moving in a parabola. R for, for the problems that we do, r is a constant and that means all of its time derivatives are zero. Okay, so just keep that in mind. That's, that's a point that gets lost on a lot of physics students even including myself for a while, I didn't quite have that straight in my head. This is only the, the acceleration along the R axis if you're moving in a fixed circle. Okay, F sub T, the force along the tangential direct direction, that would be mass times tangential acceleration where A tangential is R alpha. Angular acceleration, so off to the side here, I'll write alpha is the same thing as theta double dot, which is the same as d omega dt. Don't forget about that third axis. We actually will need this equation sometimes. The sum of the forces in the z direction will be mass times acceleration in the, in the z direction. If you're moving in this circle, there's no reason you would be accelerating out of the page or into the page. So we just set that equal to zero. And I'm gonna put a, 
a big box around all of these. These are, these comprise your starting point for any circular motion problem. Now, some of the problems are even simpler. Notice how two out of the three equations have a non-zero term on the right side. Right side. There's uh, an additional restriction that shows up in many problems, which makes it even simpler. So for uniform circular motion specifically, and what does it mean to be in uniform circular motion? That means that your speed is constant. So if you're not speeding up or slowing down, well, what does that say about, let's see here. We can use one of these equations, yeah. DT or DDT of speed. If your speed is not changing, then the time derivative would be zero. And that means that the time derivative of omega is zero. Well, the time derivative of omega is what we call alpha. So alpha is zero since a tangential is zero. Remember, a tangential is our alpha. So let me, let me summarize that again. If you're always moving at a constant speed, you're driving around a racetrack at constant speed, then you're not accelerating along the tangential axis. If you have no tangential acceleration, you also have no angular acceleration alpha. Alpha is zero, or in other words, state a double dot is zero. And that means that the right side of this equation is also zero. So whether you're, you know, you could think in terms of tangential acceleration or angular acceleration. If one is zero, so is the other. Okay, so for uniform circular motion problems, the right side of this equation is also zero. And then only one out of the three equations has a non-zero right-hand side. Those problems tend to be a little simpler. So this is all going to make more sense when we look at some examples, but this is your most important page of, of notes here from this video. Here's where you start. So if you didn't follow all that um, discussion about polar coordinates, R hat, and theta hat, that's okay. The main thing is you need to know how to use these equations. In this class, you're always gonna set the forces in the z direction to zero. Now, does that mean you don't even need to write the equation? Not necessarily. Sometimes you will have forces along the z axis. And by setting them equal to zero, you might learn something about the relationship between those forces. So you may have to write all three equations in order to solve a problem, even if one of the equations has a right-hand side of zero, or even if two of the equations have a right-hand side of zero. So I'm gonna come back to this box when it comes time to solve some problems. I'll save those for another video.